McMajin with the Duke Spine Institute. We are getting ready to show you a live spine surgery on a back of a patient suffering with back pain, leg pain. This patient has a grade two spondylolisthesis at L5S1 and a grade one spondylolisthesis at L45. This patient has herniated discs at L45, L5S1 and spondylolisthesis and we have now performed Duke laser disc repair on about 50 patients that have spondylolisthesis maybe up closer to 100 um, but 50 with grade 2 and at least 100 with grade 1 and every single one of them we've been able to get rid of their back pain and leg symptoms without doing anything for the spondylolisthesis. It's all the disc herniation at the spondylolisthesis that causes the symptoms. So let's see if we can have another success here today. As always, our patient is awake when we do lumbar Duke laser disc repair. And Duke laser disc repair is endoscopic spine surgery. So we're gonna make a tiny little incision in the skin on the side and go in at a 45 degree angle to the spine, going in through a natural hole that's already there called the neuroforamen. But I have to say, this is gonna be one of the tougher ones to do. So without further ado, we'll get started. If you have questions during the surgery, feel free to ask. All right, this is Dr. Duke, we're gonna get started, okay? That's my hand on your back. I'm gonna keep you awake for a few minutes to help me. I'm gonna give you some numbing medicine in just a second. You'll feel a little stick and burn, okay? You feel, you feel my fingers back here? All right, if you feel any pain, just say, ouch. Don't try to move or get off the table. Are you comfortable where you are? Is that a yes? All right, good. Like I said, you'll feel a little burning. That's just the medicine, the numbing medicine going in. That's perfectly normal. And I'm gonna be talking to you and some other people as well while we're doing the surgery. Okay? All right. So, <coughs> that, that hurt? All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And once again, as I said before, this is not an easy level to do shot because we need an AP first. I'm gonna have to start further north. This is um, as hard as it gets on a scale of one to 10. This would be a 10. And the reason for that, again, is the fact that the bones are slipping at L5-S1. And L5-S1 is the hardest level to do anyway. So the slippage just makes it even harder. Let's see if we can do this. And you can see the angle I need to come in at is very steep. Shut up. Let's go lateral. Are you comfortable? You can see the scoliosis of the spine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Shot. Shot. You'll feel a little discomfort. That's normal. Is that it? Yes. Shot. Uh huh. You're doing great, by the way. Shot. Uh huh. Go close. Shot. 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 Where do you feel that, sweetheart? Where are you feeling that pain? Shot. Is 
Scott. AP. Sean. Uh uh. Lateral. I need to do more medial. Testing, can you hear me? Scott? Sean? In AP. Lateral. Start a little further up. You have somewhere local? Good. Nice job. Way to be prepared. Yeah, that's just the numbing medicine going in. So, because of her uh, sacral L5S1 steep angle, <laughs> we are having to start much further up towards the head than we normally would Chuck but that's the only way we're gonna be able to get into 5-1 Chuck 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 and Dr. Santiago is doing a Phenomenal job of keeping this patient comfortable. Shot. Let's see what we can do with WAG. I think we're a little bit off with the WAG, a little bit. Let's see what we can do with it. Let's WAG and see what that does for us. That's worse. Try the other way. That's definitely better. Um, I wonder if we need a little bit more. Let's try a little bit more and see what happens. I think that's pretty good. I don't think we're going to get better than that. How's blood pressure? Perfect. Where was she when you when you started with her? So all the other doctors are telling me you can't get the blood pressure down without putting the patient under propofol. Well, the thing is that when you start lowering that blood pressure without the propofol, you may have the propofol that you can use, but it's like extremely low. You know, the propofol is just a hormone that lowers the blood pressure. Oh, I know that, you but. My my point is that they think you can't lower blood pressure in, in the, the operating, operating room, room without propofol. And I said, well, how do we get people with high blood pressure to lower their blood pressure regularly without every day propofol. without propofol? Right? How many million people in the United States? Is that it? How many million people in the United States have high blood pressure? And it's controlled with medication and not propofol. <laughs> so why can't you get there, right? Where do you feel that? Your back? Where do you feel that? Your, your back? Sean? Your nerves? Yeah, we're nowhere near her nerves, so I'm not too worried about that yet. Sean? Yeah, I'm sorry. This is the worst part of the surgery. I apologize. Sean? Uh, 
I promise you haven't made it easy for me, Sean. Sean? 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 Do you feel anything there? Huh? Where? Sean? That's it right there? Take another shot. All right. Go ahead and give me uh, uh, an AP. So this is probably a 10 and a half out of 10. This is the hardest I've ever done. And you can see we're starting really high up. Yeah, so we're too lateral. Go back to a, a lateral, please. All right, two centimeters away, but we're further than that. Let's get an AP. I think I'm too far off. Are you comfortable? Yeah, it's way too far off. All right, let's go back to a lateral. Actually, uh, you can stay with the AP for a minute. What's that? You're doing fine. Yeah, let's go lateral. Yeah. We just need you awake for the beginning. It's just your anatomy is very difficult to do. On a scale of 1 to 10, you're about a 10. Or a little bit more than 10, I should say. Sean? Maybe a 12. Sean, you're doing good. Just hang in there, Sean. Let's get an AP. All right, it's better. Lateral. Are you comfortable? Sean? Give me an AP. You can see the bone is just pushing the needle tip forward uh, up towards the head. That's right there. Back to a lateral. And when you're dealing with a uh, pars defect like she has, you get a lot of scar tissue right around that pars defect, which is right where we are. And that scar tissue is going to try to push you, push your, your needle and everything in directions you don't want it to go. Sean? Are you uncomfortable? Shot. I don't know how I got that, but it's nothing short of a miracle. AP? So, truth be told, uh, there are very few surgeons in the world, probably uh, literally I'm the only one that would be that would even attempt 
to get into this kind of an L5S1. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it, are you comfortable? Are you comfortable? Okay. John, let's see where we are. See if we can get a little die in there. John. All right, we're in the disc. Go lateral. I mean, so the truth is, people who do endoscopic, there's only five in the United States, they don't do L5S1. They won't do it because it's too hard. And then this is like tripling the L5S1 in difficulty. And I'm only saying, I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, trust me. I, I feel, yes, you do as good as you can, humanly possible, but sometimes you need some luck. But what I'm saying is, you won't see this done anywhere else anywhere else because no one else would even try it it would be like tightrope walking across niagara falls i mean there aren't huh yeah winnie day with no 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 safety line <laughs> ay, ay, ay. all right but like i said it's better to be lucky than good so now we're going to get to L45, which is the next disc. And by the way, your x-ray picture is perfect for 4.5. Let's just see where we need to be. Hopefully it'll be pretty close to where we are. If not, yeah, I guess I do. I'll make an incision and see if we can make it from here. I may have to make a separate incision for the next level because L5S1 is so far north. When we say north, we're talking about um, towards the head. In, in spine, when a surgeon says north, it means towards the head. South is towards the feet. So our patient here uh, has our starting point for this L5S1 needle that we just placed is really, it's up here, normally it would be here. So look how different that is than the normal position for L5S1 without a listhesis. John? Okay, so wow, we're really north. Like I said. And besides the listhesis, our patient is also rotated. Like she has what's called a, a scoliosis of the spine. John? The important thing here, though, is to uh, appreciate the fact that this patient, we're treating her back pain and her leg symptoms from radiculopathy, we're treating it without correcting deformity. So we're not going to be fixing her scoliosis. We're not going to be fixing the listhesis. Yeah, you're doing great. We're almost done. We're going to put you to sleep soon. John. So did you hear about our last anesthesiologist? The last fellow? <laughs> I fired him without even putting him in the operating room to do anesthesia. He said, I can't do this case without using some crazy like remifentanyl and uh, sufentanyl. I don't know, what, what I don't even know these drugs, they're so powerful. And I said, we do it all the time without you, these drugs. We just use fentanyl and the other stuff. I said, go look at Dr. Santiago's uh, anesthesia record, you know? He said, oh, I don't need to look at Dr. Santiago's anesthesia. I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this 30 years. But he has all these crazy demands. And I just said, you know what? You're a pain in the ass. Goodbye. Got rid of him. John? These guys are idiots, you know? They think they have me uh, as a hostage. And I'm like, no, you don't get it. We're doing you a favor, giving you this fellowship. <laughs> we have a, a neurologist now who's coming. Sean? 
and he wants to fellowship, he's going to do neurology one day a week, you know. AP, yeah, it's great because we've wanted a neurologist for a long time. It's so hard to find a good neurologist. We have a lot of crazy neurologists. Any good anything. Any good anything in medicine these days. It's so damn hard. All right, let's go lateral again. There's so many literally shitty doctors out there. I never realized how many bad doctors there were. I had my dad my whole life when I grew up. It was my father. And he was a great doctor. He always cared about the patients, enjoyed practicing medicine, doing what was right. He, he made so much sacrifice for his patients. No, they don't. They don't know what sacrifice means. And he's a foreigner, of course. All right, are you comfortable? So normally, folks, we would do the, the, the needle at L45, which is what's this here, and L5S1 would be the same hole, but you can see they're not even close. They're two finger breaths apart. All right. You comfortable, Ben? Very comfortable. All right. You can say it. How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? Seven? Is that where you typically get your pain? All right. So, but it's in that area of your back, correct? How bad is that on a scale of one to ten? Nine. So a seven at four five, a nine at five one, concordant at both. Okay, you get to go to sleep, and when you wake up, we'll be done. We'll be done with your surgery. I'm going to start with four five today. Well, folks, for the, if you've been watching, um, the reason we broadcast all of our surgeries is because every single one is different. It's similar but different, all right? It would be like going around the United States and having a hamburger at every place you could have a hamburger. I'm not talking about McDonald's either. I'm talking about like every... every um, grill, you know, every mom and pop grill, every hamburger is going to be different no matter what, because everyone makes it different. The ingredients are different. The way they prepare it is different. The cut of the meat could be different. Some put more garlic. Some don't use garlic at all, et cetera, et cetera. So just like hamburgers are different, every patient is different and everyone poses a different challenge. Sure, they're all hamburgers and every one of my patients are Duke laser disc repairs but they're never the same and every one of them is slightly different so the major parts like the burger the meat the buns the the dressing you know the ketchup mustard those are all kind of similar right and same thing with the technique we use we start with the needles we come from the side but exactly where we put the needle exactly the trajectory how we get into the disc is different with every patient and this one was a really, really challenging one. Sorry. I said I'm starting with 4-5, which I will. So during the surgery, we broadcast live so you can be here with us in the operating room and you can experience the surgery as we do at the same time that we do. If there are challenges or difficulties, you're going to live through it with us. Um, but he also gives you an opportunity to ask questions. So feel free to ask questions. All right, we're going to start with the top disc, L45. You can see the dye that I injected into the... Can you bring the x-ray view up, Sean? So you can see on the x-ray view, the lateral view. Do you have that, Sean? Is that up? Is he not able to respond to us? Is the mic? Unreal. Can you imagine if my surgeries went as bad as our broadcast IT did? <laughs> I mean, how hard is it to get a mic to work right, for God's sakes? Sonny, I'm starting to, my blood's starting to boil a little bit. All right, anyway, folks, for those of you watching, 
Um, you can see on the x-ray view, the side view, the dye, the black dye that I injected into the L45 disc is actually leaking out through a tear in the back of the disc and it's going over the herniation. You can see the hump of the herniation in the back there. So that's the L45 herniation. L5S1 is harder to see, but there's definitely a tear in the back. You can see the dye leaking. These tears, folks, are the key to curing discogenic back pain. And I'm the one who discovered that, and I'm the one who published the very first surgery in the world to repair those tears, called the Duke Laser Disc Repair. All right, so we're going to go in there now, and we're going to fix L4-5 first, and then we'll do L5-S1 last. So without further ado, we'll get started. We put our guide wire down. You can come back to the operating room view. So now we have a guide wire, which is this metal, um, I don't know what you call it, wire, right? And I'm going to make an incision. <laughs> right. Right. All right, Sonny. So you got Troy on the phone. Yeah. I don't see why it would be a Troy issue, but that's okay. So if you have questions, just type them up and I'll answer them for you. Sean has done a phenomenal job of um, preparing some material for you all to watch. If you look at the screen, I think there'll be a place you could actually click on to upload an MRI if you have, uh, you want to know if this surgery will work for you. If you have a herniated or bulging disc in your back or neck and you have pain, this surgery will work for you. Pretty much anybody with chronic pain, 99% of those patients, this surgery will work to get rid of your pain. Um, I can't say 100% because some people have some really weird stuff like they've had their whole spine fused and they're still having pain, but this surgery may not work for that. Um, so there's, there's a few people like with tumors, infections, weird stuff, fractures, that this surgery wouldn't work for, but 99% of people with chronic back or neck pain, this surgery would work for. But you can submit your MRI. You can also download our app. All right, we're coming in with a dilator in the foramen, coming to the back of the 045 disc shot. And the tip of this dilator will be pushing on the herniation momentarily. Our patient is asleep, by the way, in case you're wondering. Sean? All right, so now the tip of the dilator is at the herniation and it's starting to push it back in through the tear. Sean? And I'm just working the dilator with my hands. I've done everything I can with my hands. Now to advance this dilator into the disc space, I'm going to use a, a hammer a mallet, and this is going to be one of the more painful moments of the surgery for the patient, which is why she's completely asleep. And Dr. Santiago is a master of anesthesia, like I'm a master of spine surgery, and the patient isn't even doing anything to respond, so he has perfect control of the patient, which is, believe me, uh, believe me it's not easy to do. There's very few anesthesiologists that can do that as I've proven over and over again. While the patient's still moving. Yeah, <laughs> while the patient is safe. Sure. Yeah, anyone can make a patient not move, but then you put the patient at risk of asphyxiation or aspiration. But Dr. Santiago has mastered this technique. Shot. Shot. So I'm advancing the cannula, which is otherwise known as the tubular retractor. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. We're going to bring the dilator out, shot. And now you can see the, the tubular retractor or cannula is another name for it right here. This is inside the disc. And we're on the right side of the patient. This is the left side. The line here is the middle of the spine, the middle of the back. And we're fixing two herniated discs, one at L4-5, the other at L5-S1. And the most important thing about this case is, wow, look at this lady has got spondylolisthesis grade, one, grade two at L5-S1. So every other surgeon I know would do a fusion to, to fix this problem. And would a spinal fusion work? 
The answer is yes. At L5S1, it would work. But here's the key. 99% of spine surgeons would only fix L5S1. They would have left L4-5 alone because they always do one disc at a time. Some surgeons are willing to do more than that, but most spine surgeons only fuse one level at a time. Bring it out, please. So this patient would still have back pain. Wait, 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 move away from that. That's good enough. It's supposed to be on the bottom of my hand. Okay, it's supposed to be down here, underneath. Okay. All right, so the point I'm getting at is patients with a spondylolisthesis like this lady that goes and gets spine surgery, the surgeon's only going to do one level, L5S1, which, is, which means she's going to come out of that surgery and still have pain because the L4-5 level, the level we're doing right now, would have been left alone. They would say it's not bad enough to treat. But guess what? It's causing her horrible pain. We just tested it with a discogram. So this is a perfect example of the biggest problem in spine surgery today, surgeons under-treating their patients. Surgeons under-treating their patients. <coughs> and it's, it's systemic. And it's pandemic. Surgeons under-treating their patients. Meaning they don't treat all the painful levels during one surgery. They just treat one level. Because spine surgery takes a long time to do. It's very difficult, challenging. And the more levels they treat, the more risk of having a complication, malpractice. So most surgeons just treat one level. At Duke Spine Institute, we treat all the levels that are painful. And you're gonna see with the Duke laser disc repair, that's possible to do. You just have to know which levels are painful. So spine surgeons, patients who undergo back surgery in 2020 fail to improve because the surgeon most likely did not treat all their areas of pain. They only treated one. And this is a very, very common thing to happen. I see it all the time with other surgeons. So the patients come out of surgery, they make a recovery, and they still have back pain because they have tr levels that were not treated, unfortunately. All right, here is the cause of everyone's back pain when it comes from a disc. The annular tear, right there. The white fibers are the annulus. The blue is the herniation. There's a piece of herniation right there. We're going to get it out. The laser you see is a blue fiber. It brings laser energy from a machine, which is at the patient's feet right over here. There's a giant machine. It's the size of a large suitcase, like a Samsonite suitcase. And it's heavy. It's on wheels. And it takes 220 volts of electricity. You can't even plug it into a 110. You need a 220 outlet. It pulls so much electricity, so much energy to create a laser pulse that does two things, coagulates the tissue and also a sonic wave that blasts the tissue. And that sonic wave passes through the liquid that you see is surrounding here, which is saline. And you can see little bits and pieces of the herniation coming off with the laser. So the laser doesn't just cook. A very important, the Homium YAG laser and the one that we use, specifically this one, as opposed to the other ones that are out there, this specific laser creates a shock wave that blasts, once I cook and coagulate the tissue, it blasts it out of there. And if you don't blast it out of there, the laser will just turn it into char. And we don't want that. We don't want char down here. We just want to remove the pathological tissue, debris the annulus, but not create char. So we have a combination of fluid moving through the system all the way down, which is saline on a bag under pressure, high pressure. And we have the pulse wave. There's a piece of herniation right there. We have the pulse wave of the laser in the water and that pulse wave like basically disrupts or vibrates right out these pieces of herniation once they're, once they're coagulated. Once again, this is L4-5. This is 
one of the two discs we came to fix. Sean, any questions from our audience? Oh yeah, Sean. Sean is going to have some trouble communicating. So this is the annular tear. All right, go ahead and ask the question. All right, I, I heard that why does the clarity of the lateral radiograph lack what? Oh, great question. So the reason why the x-ray is not as good on the lateral view is because um, you're going through the side of the patient, which has a lot more soft tissue and a lot more bones. Like we're getting the pelvis, more of the pelvis bones. We're getting more of the hips. So there's more tissue for the radiation beam to go through. Uh, human tissue basically obstructs the movement of the radiation beam through the body. So the more soft tissues and hard tissues like bones there are, the worse picture that comes out the other side. So that's, that's the best explanation I can give you. We are using the very best x-ray machine in the world in the operating room. There is nothing better. This is a Siemens flat panel. It's literally the top of the line. So this is as good as we have available today in the world, but even then it's not perfect. So that's why it's so important. You can see the, the quality of the lateral view is not great. Can you imagine if we didn't have the best fluoro? The view would be even worse and it would be even harder to see anything. That's why we invest at Duke Spine Institute in the best equipment in the world because we want the best results. If your fluoro is a cheap one, which a lot of places have cheap fluoros, Sorry, but they have things like OEC, you know, from GE. In my opinion, it's not as good, not even close. Uh, if you're using an old OEC, you're not going to be able to see very well. And honestly, you're bringing up a great question, which is the quality of the imaging in the operating room. Very important to be able to do good surgery. If, you can, if a surgeon can't see what they're doing very well, they're not going to do a great job. We're not changing an oil filter here, folks. We're doing very sophisticated surgery that requires precise, high quality imaging to guide the surgeon to where they need to be. So yes, if the quality of the pictures is not the very best, you're not gonna get the very best results. And this is the very best you can do. So I just work with it. I have enough experience doing these surgeries. I can see what I need to see. <coughs> and I, more importantly, I can also feel what I need to feel with that, with that needle. If you watch me put the needle in, I didn't just jam it in quickly. I took my time. I navigated it. I'm actually navigating that needle. So when you watch me put that needle in, I'm like pushing it left, right, up, down, in, out, twisting it, turning it. And it's, it's, it's not like just sticking a a turkey basting needle with saline into a turkey and injecting. You've got to be in exactly within not even a millimeter degree of error. You need to be in the right spot or you're never going to get in at L5S1. That's what we were talking about earlier. We we're kind of laughing about it that um, I got pretty lucky today getting into L5S1. Um, yes, of course, there's an element of skill, but there's also an element of the anesthesiologist helping me by keeping the patient comfortable. And if that patient is in pain from me sticking the needle in, and I can only do so much local anesthetic, you know? And that's something the other anesthesiologist told me, by the way, he said, just use more local. <laughs> I'm like, you think I'm an idiot? You know what I mean? I, I know exactly how much local I can use and how much I can't use. You can't just numb all the way down to the nerve. It's not possible. So you're gonna end up with a nerve block and you don't want that. So I can only use so much local anesthetic. So it's very important the patient's comfortable while I'm putting that needle in. But the fluoro guides me to where I need to be. So, 
but it really is, you need to have a very good anesthesiologist keeping the patient under good pain control while I'm guiding that needle in so the patient isn't tightening up, moving around, and making it difficult for me to get the needle in the right spot. If I don't have confidence in my anesthesiologist, I can't do the surgery. Uh, grabber, standby laser. Do we get the mic working yet? I'll take that as a no. So that's the disc right there. This thing is going into the disc and pulling out pieces of herniation, these little pieces, you can see them coming out, they're blue. And the reason they're blue is when I did the discogram, I put some dye in there that stains them blue. And the reason is so that I can see the herniations and I can do the surgery better when I can see the herniation. So it was my intention to stain the herniations blue. Of course, the annulus itself doesn't stain blue, it stays white. And the posterior longitudinal ligament is gonna be white but the disc herniations are gonna be blue. Now I use a straight firing laser for my surgery. Some surgeons that do endoscopic spine surgery like a, a side firing laser. I personally have not used a side firing laser. I don't like a side firing laser. Um, I've tried them out before. I don't, want it. I don't want a side firing laser for a lot of reasons. I don't think they add. Clearly, I've had very, very good results with a straight firing laser. So, hey, by the way, Luis, you see the fray on the blue cable, yes, on sir. the blue plastic? We need to address that. Yes, sir. That's why I'm, uh, I'm putting, setting the, the other one to a container. Yeah. I'm sure that uh, fire is through there. And no, there's no fire. Uh, I mean, I don't see any light. Well, it, it, w it will weaken the beam for sure. But um, yeah, I would say we need to we need to resurrect this thing with a little TLC. Just about done. This is L45 once again. This was a grade one spondylolisthesis. We are not fusing the spondylolisthesis. We're just treating the herniated disc here. That's all. And we're going to be able to get rid of this woman's pain without fusing. And that's what makes this surgery so special. Here's herniation right here. And this is so scarred in, it doesn't even stain blue because the dye never got to it. So, but it's still a herniation and inflammation. You can see the pink color. That's called granulation tissue. If you understand inflammation and the inflammatory process, You'll know what granulation tissue is. It's the healing tissue. It's early scar tissue. The problem is it's only supposed to be there for about a week and then it's supposed to go away. But this granulation tissue has been here for years and that's why it's so painful. Because the inflammation in this woman's disc has never stopped since her injury. And that's what we're here to remove is that inflammatory tissue with the laser. Some bone spur right there, calcified herniation. Bone spurs turn a golden color. This is a bone spur right here. You see that, how it's protruding out? It's corticated, it's got diploic bone. We're not doing anything with that because it's not bothering anything. It's not causing any symptoms. There's no point in me treating it because treating it is not gonna make her any better. This bone spur is not in a place that's a problem. If it was, we would remove it with the laser, but it's not. So we don't treat things that aren't causing problems. If you have a red ant mound in your garden where you walk all the time in your grass, you're gonna treat it. But if you find a red ant mound out in the forest somewhere, you're not gonna treat it. 
You leave it alone because it's not bothering you, not bothering anybody. You leave it alone. So the same thing in surgery. Things that aren't bothering the patient or bo hurting them in any way, you don't treat them. You only treat the things that are causing problems. All right, we're just about done here. I feel like we got a really good disc annular debridement. And let's take a look at the nerve. The nerve is going to be up in this fat right here. And it, there's the, the disc right there. The herniation was sticking out here. It's now gone. Just do a little bit more right here. Now this will heal now properly because we got rid of the, the herniated disc that was stuck in the annular tear. It's all dense scar tissue right here. Mature scar tissue. This stuff is not as important. We wanted the granulation tissue. We wanted the nuclear interposed nucleus propulsus. That's what was causing this problem. Laser off. So we're done here. I'm gonna turn off the irrigation. Suck this hole dry. All right, so we're done with L45. And we're gonna take this tube out. Yep. You all see that tube there? That's how we do this endoscopic surgery, through a tube, a metal tube. And I'm gonna put some pressure here, go ahead. And the pressure is to uh, keep the muscles or anything in there from bleeding. The blood loss with this surgery is minimal. Come on, come on in with the fluoro. Watch your shoulder. She's going to hit your shoulder. Watch this. I don't want it sticking into my gown. So the blood loss for these surgeries is usually just about a few drops of blood. Um, we obviously take measures to control the blood loss. I keep the systolic blood pressure around 100, and we make sure the patients have stopped. Don't take a shot yet, but we make sure the pa you got to go to a lateral view, please. We make sure the patients have stopped taking any blood thinners. And you know, there's really two types of blood thinners. There's there's things that block the platelets from making a plug. The platelet plug is the first step in blood clotting or, you know, stopping bleeding, hemostasis. And then the second is a, is a blood clot, and that's made with uh, proteins that are dissolved in the blood. So step one is a platelet plug. Step two is clotting of the blood. And compounds, molecules, chemicals, drugs that affect platelet plug or affect clotting will cause you to bleed. So we make sure all of our patients are off any blood thinners before they have surgery. Okay, are you ready? Come off. So, um, shot. All right, so we need to fix that. You need to be more north and the table may need to be down a little bit. Just a little bit, good. Yeah, you got to get that north. Would somebody help her over here, please? She's struggling with the endoscopy tower. All right, that's good. Yeah, you're fine right there. You don't need to go any further north. All right, so, um, you know, there are medications that we prescribe patients that thin their blood, and then there are things that people take, like herbal supplements that actually thin their blood. So you got to make sure patients are off all the prescribed blood thinners, but also they have to be off of any kind of herbal medication or non-prescribed blood thinners. For example, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, Motrin, ibuprofen, naproxen, aspirin, naproxen, Aleve, all of those, BC powder, goodies powder, those are all blood thinners because they have an effect on the platelets. Shot. All right, perfect. So I can see the guide wire is there at the front of the needle. Shot. What is that in the way? Can you move that, please? Hey, that's your job is to move this stuff out of the way, okay? Come on, Sam. Shot. Shot. 
Um, so then there's herbal medications that thin the blood, ginkgo biloba, fish oil, turmeric. I call them herbal. Fish oil is not really herbal, but I don't even know wh what's in fish oil. Linoleic, linolenic acids. Those are essential fatty acids. I'm not sure what else is in fish oil, but fish oil definitely makes blood thin and bleed. So people having surgery should be off the herbals. They should be off their fish oil. They should be off their um, anti-inflammatories, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and of course their prescription blood thinners. All right, so we're going for L5S1. By far, this is the most difficult L5S1 I've probably ever done. And we're just going to take our time. I'm going to massage the dilator down, down the guide wire. But it's an interesting process with the surgery. You start with a needle <coughs> and you basically use the needle to find a safe path from the outside world where we have all of our tools to do the surgery into the annular tear and herniation shot. I'm not making a whole lot of progress. Um, and then once your needle is in position, you basically, in my opinion, the rest of the surgery is pretty straightforward, Sean. Because that needle creates a safe, safe path and everything else just spreads the tissues where the needle was. And spreading tissues doesn't hurt tissues. Okay, we're making slow but steady progress. We're coming down to that area of lots of scar tissue because she has a pars defect or basically a fracture through a piece of bone back here. And that fracture she's had for a long time. And that fracture, when it happened, created inflammation at the fracture. And, that, and then a callus formed. A callus is basically a bunch of scar tissue. The fracture tried healing itself, but it didn't never healed properly. And so you never got bone bone fusion and the healing. So she just has all this scar tissue there and it's all hypertrophied and thickened, basically trying to stabilize this area. Her body is trying to stabilize, but that's not the source of her pain. Pain is coming from really from the, uh, the disc as it almost always does. Once again, this angle is absolutely extreme. Shot. It's time to bring the mallet in. Like I said, normally L5S1 is down here. It's like this, you know, for reference. And she's way up here, kind of almost against the bottom of her ribs. And it's almost impossible to do this. Shot. I have to visualize. Shot. Yeah, it's not easy. Shot. That's the key. Jesus. Incredible. Shot. I'm going to have to bring it back a little bit. <coughs> this will be the, the part that's probably most uncomfortable for her. So she's nice and controlled right now. Shot. That's just unreal. Shot. Shot. Slowly but steady. Shot. Shot. 
shot. I felt it go. It's definitely in there. My God. Look at the angle. Incredible. Good luck with that one. Shot. Yeah, we're in there. I wanted to go more medial. Shot. That's about as good as we're going to get right there. Whew. That's work. That is work. Please don't try this at home. Seriously, that is the hardest I've ever done. And I don't mean like, you know, physically the hardest. I mean, just that, that space was so collapsed. Um, and that L5 bone at the top there above the, the endoscope was, was slipped so far forward. That's incredible. Uh -huh. All right, so what I want to do here is I want to bring this. Yeah, she doesn't like it. All right, I'm going to bring this dilator back a little bit. Hold on, let's see, shot. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, we've pinched some tissue between the dilator and the endoscope tube. Shot. All right, that's promising. Yeah. I think we're just going to take that dilator out. I think our tube is about as good as we're going to get it. Incredible shot. Yeah. Holy mackerel. That's in there good. So <laughs> let me have it back. Yeah, the reason why uh, the dilator is not coming out easy is it's, it's literally there's a piece of herniation stuck between the dilator and the endoscop endoscopic tube. Whew. And it's, it's almost like welding the two of them together, you know? There's something that happens in wolves that's similar. <laughs> oh, there it is. You can see it right there. That's a piece of disc herniation. And it basically just wedged into a space where there is no space. And by doing that, it compressed the dilator against the endoscopic tube. Look at that angle. This angle is incredible. I've never had an angle like that. I've had close, but no, 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 no. This is, I'm just like, oh yeah, okay, fine. All right. <coughs> and for, you know, I'm gonna say this as my philosophy. When I see a problem that needs to be fixed, and no matter how hard it's going to be to fix it, if I believe I'm capable of doing it, I'll go for it. Um, as long as it's not going to be risky to the patient to the point that I'm going to hurt the patient. 
So if I get in the operating room, I'm unable to do something safely and it's gonna cause a problem for the patient they didn't have before, I'm gonna stop before I create that problem. Especially if the problem is a permanent problem. Obviously, everybody that has a surgery has a skin incision. It's unavoidable. You have to have a skin incision. Everybody that has this surgery has a little bit of few drops of blood they lose. That's unavoidable. That's not permanent harm. A skin incision heals, and surgeries are always done through skin incisions. And a little bit of bleeding, no big deal. But if I'm going to do something that's going to hurt the patient permanently, like injure a body part that will that will create a huge problem for them. I'm not going to do it. So that's where s your surgeon, you want a surgeon who knows basically when to stop. But you also want a surgeon who's good enough they can, they can overcome most challenges in the operating room and not just give up easily and run away. So having a, a doctor who, who really, like the same thing with anesthesia, it's no different. If you have a sick patient, who needs a procedure, they need anesthesia. Why is the irrigation so bad? Oh, uh, it's never mind. It's actually pretty good. I'm not sure why it looked bad here. Maybe it was just momentary. Um, you know, there are anesthesiologists that are afraid to put pa patients to sleep. They can't do it safely. And then there are really good ones that can put a patient to sleep, um, even though the patient's more challenging to do. They just find a way to do it and get it done. I mean, it, it doesn't matter what you're doing in medicine. There are those doctors that are really, really good at doing what they do and love what they do and are passionate about it and love the challenge and but won't compromise or hurt the patient. They won't kill the patient or, you know, put them on life support. And then there are doctors who don't understand those boundaries. Doesn't everybody deserve a chance? Everyone deserves a chance. That's right. Dr. Santiago is saying everyone deserves a chance, but you don't turn patients down because you feel uncomfortable. If we, if we only operated on things we were totally comfortable, we probably wouldn't. And if you only put patients to sleep that were, you know, 100%, you know, there's no way anything bad could happen, you wouldn't put anybody to sleep because with it doesn't matter how small the procedure is, the risk is always there of something bad happening. And it's funny because a lot of patients say to me, what's the anesthesia for this? And I say, it's twilight. And they say, oh, good. You know, I'm happy about that. Like they don't want endotracheal innovation and in general, yet that's safer. It's, safer. <laughs> it's much safer for them, but they don't understand that. They all think twilight is safer, but it's not. Twilight is how Michael Jackson died. But he wasn't, he didn't have an anesthesiologist. He was just doing his own twilight anesthesia with propofol. The point is, is that that case illustrates how, s how dangerous, you know, anesthesia can be if, if the patient isn't monitored and resuscitated properly. If Michael Jackson was under general endotracheal anesthesia, he never, he never would have died. If he had a tube down, he never would have died. So it's the fact that he didn't have a tube down when he anesthetized himself that uh, he died. So for those of you who remember who Michael Jackson is, it's unfortunate he's remembered that way, you know? I grew up in the Michael Jackson era, and he was a superstar, a mega star. He was the number one musician in the world. We don't even have that kind of stuff anymore. You know, there is no such thing anymore of a, the concept of the number one musician in the world. That's gone forever. You realize that? I was watching a movie, an old movie last night. Anybody ever see the movie called Black Rain? It's a phenomenal movie. It's from the 19, I think it's from... Uh, the 1990s, Black Rain. If you get a chance, watch it. But it's a movie about Michael Douglas as a cop 
who is chasing a, a Yakuza gang, um, one of the gang lords back to Japan with his partner. And a very prominent Japanese businessman says to him, America is only good for music and movies. And of course, that was back in the day of Michael Jackson, back in the 80s, when the movie was made. And of course, Michael Jackson was an American musician. So it just shows you how influential American music was back then around the world. Even in a society like Japan, that back in the 80s was super technologically advanced, far more advanced than China was. And we used to buy all of our high quality electronics from Japan. So Michael Jackson was a, a mega superstar all around the world. And literally, for those of you who don't know who Michael Jackson is, he, he was literally and will always be the number one musician in the world. Nobody has ever gone beyond what Michael Jackson has done worldwide. Heck, they haven't even done it in the United States. Every single person alive back in the 80s knew who Michael Jackson was. Virtually everybody I knew had posters of Michael Jackson in their room. He was all over MTV. I mean, he was a superstar. But what I'm saying is you can't get that anymore. Even if you take the very best musicians in the United States, they're nowhere near as popular as Michael Jackson was, where every single person in the United States knew who he was. And then you go to the world, and if it's a popular star in America, the chances are they're not going to be known in other countries. People will say, who's that? Who's that? I have no idea. never heard of them. Because they have their own musicians now from their countries. Did you know who Michael Jackson was? Sure. Growing up in Egypt, right? So Michael Jackson was popular in Egypt. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Everyone knew who he was around the world. Now, of course, he had some bad, bad side to him as well, the dark side, the bad stuff that nobody likes. The stuff with the kids is horrible. I don't advocate for that. But I do like the fact that he literally brought the whole world together with his music. And that's something that no other artist has been able to do. And I mean no other artist. That's what made Michael Jackson so special for the people who don't know who he is. He never cussed once in his songs, did he? Did he? What? No. It was good, clean music. There was no cuss words. There was no reference to gangsters and shooting and killing and robbing. And I mean, it was just good, clean music. Great stuff. And the videos were amazing. His dancing was amazing. Yeah. Just remembering Michael Jackson here. Do you have any questions from the audience, Sean? Just about done here. We're in the L5S1 disc herniation. This stuff is old and bad. You can see all this grungy scar tissue from the herniation. All right, great. Once again, I'm Dr. R. Duke Majin. We're doing an L45 and L5S1 Duke laser disc repair, standby laser, on a patient who has slippage of bones in their spine and everybody I talk to says you can't you can't fix someone's spine without fusing it when they have a slippage nope not true at Duke Spine Institute we could do a fusion sure if you want one but why have a fusion when you can have laser surgery instead and you can fix the problem with a laser and no fusion no metal no hospital this surgery is being done outpatient folks if you're watching the surgery right now this patient's going to go home in an hour from now We'll be done in five minutes. We're going to be done with this surgery in five minutes. 
The whole incision is two little incisions, seven millimeters each. And this patient is literally going to go home in, in about an hour from now, probably under an hour. She can't drive herself home because she's had anesthesia. She'll need a driver, but she's going to go home nonetheless. Do we get that microphone working yet? It sounds like it wants to work. No? I know. I'm just poking at Sunny right now. I'm hoping if I poke Sunny enough, he'll be better prepared next time. Of course they should be testing. Thank you. Right, duh, that's kind of how I feel. Duh, but I'm being nice today. See, I'm being nice and my staff is being hard. I love it. That's, see, if you guys are hard on each other, then I can be nice all the time. I don't have to be mean to anybody. Right? My son said to me the other day I was busting his chops. He said, Dad, why do you have to be so hard on me? Can't you just give me a break? And I said, I'll stop being hard on you when you start being hard on yourself. Right? When you understand that you have to hold yourself accountable for your own mistakes, your own failure, your own irresponsibility, then the parents don't have to, to get on you about it. But you have to, as a parent, you got to stay on top of your kids. You got to, you know, a lot of parents these days, they don't want to be mean to their kids. They want to be friends. Parents aren't friends. I tell my kids that from time to time. I'm not your friend. I'm your dad. Don't ever mistake, don't ever make the, a mistake of the difference. Okay? As, as a friend. Friends don't, you know, tell you when you've done something wrong and hold you accountable. Sometimes they do, but my friends never did. Right? Right. Oh, my daughter is that way. God bless her, Ariana. She loves to be the funny one in the group. So she will do things that nobody else will do just to get them laughing. And I say to her, Yana, you don't want to do that. You're just going to get yourself in trouble. You're looking bad by doing that. But she's at a young age. She's only 14. At 14, you know, it's, it's important to be popular and liked and it's important to be funny for her. Don't get me wrong, she's a great student, but her friends encourage her to goof off sometimes and we try to tell her, your friends aren't laughing with you in this circumstance, they're laughing at you, you know? <laughs> She's a smart girl. She'll figure it out. Well, you know, you're a parent, right? You know what it's like, Dr. Santiago. Oh, yeah. Incredible, isn't it? How much time you have to spend saying the same thing over and over again to kids just for them to learn. Yeah, that's right. All right, we're at L5S1, and I'm just about out of the disk space. And you can actually see all that. Uh, you can see some fat at 12 o'clock. Um, the disk herniation is no longer there. It's gone. This is the back corner of the disk. So I'm going to look around just real quick, make sure I'm not missing anything. And, of course, the nerve is going to be right up in that fat right there. Um, Maybe I'll grab that little thing out right there. Take that. <laughs> Any questions for me? It's very scarred. Sounds like we might have a question.
Okay, great. So why do you use the pituitary rongeurs instead of the laser to take the disc material? I think that's what they said. Or did they say? Uh, oh. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so the, the question is, why do you even use the laser? You could use the pituitary. It's got a bigger surface area for grabbing. The reason is you can go in there and grab at this stuff, and it doesn't take it out. It doesn't grab it. So the laser is actually a much better tool, much better than the pituitary. The pituitary is good for grabbing out a fragment that's freed up, that's uh, just sitting there. And let's see if I can get you one of them. Once you've released it, you see this releasing I'm doing here? Only the laser can do that. The pituitary can't get this out. It can't divide the scar tissue. It's too tough. The pituitary is not strong enough. I know it looks big, but you don't have really good what's called mechanical advantage, squeezing the end of it together. It just doesn't hold it. It would be like trying to hold um, something big in your hands that wants to fall down out of your hands, something that's too heavy, you know, and it just slips right through your hands. So that's what happens with the pituitary. It's not strong enough to hold and pull out those, those pieces of herniation until you free them up with the laser. They're stuck there with scar tissue. That's what's holding those fragments in, is scar tissue from inflammation. And the laser is the best tool for getting rid of that, sort of cutting through the scar tissue. That's what you're seeing me do right now. I'm literally cutting these pieces out by zapping them with the laser, cutting through scar tissue. Sorry, that's the best explanation I could do. The pituitary rungers won't take this stuff out. And by the way, that's what other surgeons use during a microdiscectomy. They use pituitary rongeurs. So you can see they don't get really much out with the pituitaries. The laser is a much more effective tool for releasing fragments. All right, we are done. Done, 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 I think. Maybe just a tiny bit more right here. That's foramenal ligament right there. There's annulus that's torn. Here's herniation down here. We're zapping all that out. This is right where the nerve was being compressed. So. Pretty much done. Any more questions from the audience? Laser off. We're done. Go ahead and ask your questions if you still have some. Be happy to answer them for you. All right, yeah. You all want to see this? Let's show them, Sean. Get the light on. So the whole surgery was done through two, this time two cuts, because uh, I couldn't get them both because the angulation was so different. Okay, can you guys see the incisions right here? Two little cuts. Transforaminal. That means through the foramen where the nerve comes out. So we're using a natural hole that's already in the spine. We're not making any holes like other surgeons do. When you have a microdiscectomy to take a herniation out, you're basically having your surgeon drill a hole in your spine, taking the bone out. That's going to weaken the spine even more. It causes instability, and then you need a fusion later on. You get recurrent disc herniation. It's very common. With this technique, there's no bone taken out. We're just removing the herniation. All right. Well, I hope this works for her. We'll find out soon enough. EBL3. Okay. No complications. And it's DL, DR, right, L45, L5S1. And it was a right ischial tuberosity tendon injection. Dr. Patel.
And she needs a primary care visit for that yeah, decubitus. Thank you. All right, I'm going to come to the conference room. Is the microphone working? I hope it is. Come and answer some questions. All right, we're clearing for takeoff. There we go. This is how normally I'm running about like this. I've got my arms out. Uh, like I said, after about an hour, it was getting excruciating pain just going across my back. And uh, he's fixed all that. As long as that's fixed, I'm ready to go. Thirty years ago, I used to run motocross, cross country, did a lot of different things. Uh, but one of the biggest things I did was had a bad motorcycle wreck during that and did an end over over the handlebars and basically planted my head straight into the dirt and it jammed top of my neck, messing up three herniated discs. Uh, so I've been dealing with that for 30 years. Seems like a long time for me once you're living it. And finally, it just got to be so bad at the end, especially when I go to drive the RV. As soon as I hold my arms out for the matter of an hour, just the way the steering wheel is positioned on the, on the RV, it just takes since excruciating pain across my back. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us for the post-op Q&A. We have Dr. Duke in the room with us ready to answer some of your questions, so keep typing them in the chat below the stream. For the first question we're going to start out with comes from one of our viewers on Facebook. They ask, my MRI report specifies severe stenosis and bone overgrowth from a prior fusion at L4-5. I have leg pain all the time and can't walk. Can DLDR fix that? Okay, Dr. Dugnagin here and I hope you enjoyed our live stream broadcast of yet another spinal surgery at Duke Spine Institute. And we're going to get to your question in just a moment. I just want to say a few things first. Um, let's talk about this case first, just briefly. This was a tough one. Um, got lucky, I think, um, getting that access through the foramen at L5-S1 on that right side because uh, anytime you're dealing with spondylolisthesis, grade one is not a problem. It's easy to get in and fix the disc with a grade one slip. Um, grade two slips are much harder. For those of you who don't know what a slip is, basically there's a condition called spondylolisthesis where the bones of the spine, it could be L4-5, it could be L3-4, it could be L5-S1, and we name the slippage based on the bones that are slipping, like the top bone and the bottom bone at the slip. And so we always start with the top bone and then we go to the bottom bone second. So when I say l 4 L5 spondylolisthesis, that's a slippage of L4 on L5. And there's different kinds of slippages. There's a forward slippage, there's a backward slippage, there's a sideways slippage. And so the forward slippage is called anterolisthesis. Antero in Latin means forward. Anterolisthesis, listhes means to slip. So anterolisthesis is a forward slippage of one bone on another. So an L4-5 anterolisthesis means the L4 bone is slipping forward on the L5 bone. Retro, retro means back, as you all know, retro, you know, music, retro parties. That means going back to like the 80s, right? Retro 80s party, retro 60s party. Retro is backwards in Latin. And so retrolisthes means to slip backwards. And bones can slip forward, they can slip backwards, and then lateral, lateral means side, so lateral listhesis means a side slippage. Lateral listhesis generally result in scoliosis. So you'll see a lateral slip to the side when you have a scoliosis. But anterolisthesis, retrolisthesis are common. And um, in this case, this patient had a anterolisthesis um, 
of L5 on S1 and a anterolus thesis of L4 on L5. So she had a double slip. And the bottom slip at L5S1 was much worse. So how do we grade these listheses? Well, grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, those are your four grades. One is by far the most common. Grade two is much less common. Maybe 10% of the slips are grade two. 90, about 90% 90 of the slips are grade one. 10% are grade two. You almost never see a grade three and grade four I've never seen in 22 years of doing spine surgery. So, uh, but a grade one is, is slippage of 1% of the distance of the sacrum. Uh, that's the sacral end plate. So 1% uh, to 25%, basically. So 1% to 25%. So a quarter, the first quarter of the sacrum distance of slippage is a grade 1. Then 25 to 50% or 26 to 50% is grade 2. Uh, if you slip more than 50% of the width of the bone, then you get into a grade 3. And like I said, grade 3s are extremely rare. I see one every 10 years. That's how rare they are. And there's really only one thing to do with a grade three, and that's a fusion. Um, so grade one and grade two listheses account for about 99% of spondylolisthesis out there in the world. And the fact of the matter is, is that you don't need a fusion to fix the pain from a spondylolisthesis. There are two problems that have with sp happen with spondylolisthesis. Two types of problems can happen. And just so you all know, most spondylolistheses are asymptomatic. In other words, patients don't have any symptoms from a spondylolisthesis most of the time. So the patients that have a spondylolisthesis or slippage of the bones in their back, they don't need any treatment at all. Um, they just need to strengthen their back, keep, you know, try to minimize that slippage over time. Once the patient becomes symptomatic from a spondylolisthesis, that's when they need treatment. And really the only treatments that work um, that are the best treatments in the world are going to be surgery. And there's different surgical options, but um, I will tell you this, based on what I've seen out there, surgeons are going to recommend what they feel comfortable doing or what they want to do. And they don't always recommend what's best for their patient. And so be careful about that. If you've got a spondylolisthesis and you've been recommended for surgery, I would get a second opinion, and honestly, I'm available. I'm Dr. Duke Majin, CEO and founder of Duke Spine. I do free MRI reviews all the time, and it takes me a very small amount of time to review the MRI, so it's not a huge imposition on my time, and I want to be able to do it as a kind of a public service to help people to kind of figure out what they should be doing for their backs. I've seen so much bad recommendations for treatment in my career, and I see people just kind of um, going on a wild goose chase to get their backs fixed, and it's sad to me. It, it just breaks my heart to see people um, getting all these treatments that aren't going to work and treatments that are putting them at risk of having secondary injury. So surgery is not benign. I mean, it's, it can be very, very serious, and it can have ha horrible complications especially with incompetent spine surgeons, and there's lots of those out there, lots of incompetent spine surgeons. I have no problem saying it because it's absolutely true. But really the biggest issue for patients, and I'm a patient, I'm in the same situation. So when I have a medical problem, I want to know what the best treatment is. I want to know what the treatment that's the most effective with the lowest chance of complication, the highest success rate, and the fastest recovery. Well, if that's what I want, that's what everybody should want, to be honest with you. So that's what we do at Duke Spine Institute. We do the surgeries that have the highest success rate of fixing the problem permanently so the patient doesn't have to come back and get more treatment ever again. And we have the lowest complication rate with our procedures. So I just put myself in my patient's shoes. Whatever my patient would want, that's what I, I would want, you know, and I project that for my patient. So I imagine that I'm in their shoes, they're in my shoes, they're me basically, so what would I want if I had their problem? And the good news is at Duke Spine Institute, we can do every single spine surgery in the world. There's nothing we can't do. Spine surgery is easy for us to do. So knowing that we could do anything, okay, knowing that we had all those surgeries out there in the world available to us, what do we choose? 
Because honestly, this patient that you just saw is having surgery had the Duke laser disc repair. That is the very best in the world that you can do. What else could I have done? I could have done 90 other surgeries on her. But they won't work as well, not even close. And they're going to be a lot more painful recovery and a lot higher risk of complication. So a fusion would be my second choice in this patient. And if she didn't do the laser surgery, then I would recommend a decompression, uh, taking the pressure off the nerves, and stabilization with instrument infusion. Can I do it here at the surgery center? Absolutely. We do it all the time. Can I do it at Duke Spine Institute? Yes, no problem. Will the patient be done outpatient? Yes, all of our surgeries are outpatient. Nobody goes to the hospital. Every single spine surgery that can be done in the world, we can do it outpatient now at Duke Spine Institute. We have the technology, we have the equipment, we have the personnel, we have the medications, we have the anesthesia, we can do anything. And so knowing that we can do every spine surgery in the world, why do we choose this Duke laser disc repair? Because it's the least invasive, highest success surgery in the world. For anybody with a herniated disc, spinal stenosis, <coughs> radiculopathy, bulging disc, and even spondylolisthesis, scoliosis, kyphosis. So the patients with deformity that have symptoms like spondylolisthesis or scoliosis or even kyphosis, we can fix their pain most of the time, I'm going to say most of the time, about 98% of the time, without doing open spine surgery, by doing the endoscopic surgery you just watched today. So that's why we want to broadcast these surgeries so people can get educated about the truth and what's the best available um, service that could fix their problem. Okay, it's very important. There's a lot of misinformation out there. I hate to say it, but there's a tremendous amount of it, misinformation. And that's why I take questions. I take questions during the surgery, after the surgery, because I believe there are people out there with misinformation and they want answers. They want to know the truth. And I'll tell you the truth. Okay, whether or not you come here, it doesn't matter. You still deserve to know the truth, in my opinion. And that's what the Duke Spine Foundation believes, and that's why we, we broadcast these surgeries live so that I can answer people's questions, okay? So this question that we have from one of our viewers is saying that my MRI shows that I have severe stenosis, which is severe narrowing, and bone overgrowth from a prior fusion at 045. I have leg pain all the time, and I cannot walk. Can this surgery fix that? The answer is yes this surgery can fix your problem. Now, to tell you exactly what needs to be done, I need your MRI. I need to see it with my own eyes. I will probably want to see a CAT scan, and I really like nerve tests, especially when people have leg pain, when they have pinched nerves. Nerve tests are very important. So, whoever this person is, send us your MRI. We'll do a free review. Um, if you haven't done so already, download the Duke Spine Institute app. It's free. Like so much that we do for everybody, it's free. And the app is on Google, um, Android platform. So if you don't have an Apple computer or phone, you can download it, and it's free. It's in the App Store, Duke Spine Institute. You'll see there's an app. Um, also, if you have Apple, you can download it as well. So it's on all platforms, and it's a Duke Spine Institute app. And I believe we've created an app that is really going to be helpful to anybody that has any kind of back or neck problem and wants to learn more information. You can submit your MRI through the app. You can watch live spine surgery through the app. You can set up a teleconference through the app. And we could do a, a, tele, a teleconference with Skype through the app. We do all these things for free, folks, at Duke Spine Institute. Why do we do it for free? Because we want to help people get better. We want to help people find solutions to their spine problems. Even if we don't do the treatment ourselves, we can still advise you if you want our advice, and we do it all for free. So you're getting the advice of a 22-year veteran in neurosurgery, spine surgery, one of the top spine surgeons in the world. You're going to get that advice for free. All right? Why do we do it? Because I hate seeing people have surgeries that don't work, that are damaging and hurtful to them. And um, they just, in this day and age, it's unnecessary, especially since we can all connect over the internet and it's free. For God's sakes, take me up on it. Just get your questions answered and we'll do our best to help you, okay? You have another question? All right, we don't have another question at this time. This is our only surgery for today. 
So if you uh, decide you want to submit a question, better type quick. At least type the word wait. I have a question, and then we'll, we'll stop and wait for you. I can keep talking. But if not, then I uh, appreciate you all being here and watching this live spine surgery. You've watched laser spine surgery. This is one type of laser spine surgery, the Duke Laser Disc Repair. We've been performing the surgery now for 14 years. We've had zero complications in 14 years. There's no spine surgery in the world, folks, that is safer than the Duke Laser Disc Repair at Duke Spine Institute for fixing herniated, bulging discs, or spinal stenosis. Literally, there's no surgeon in the world that's had zero complications in their spine surgeries. I do fusion surgery as well, and I can't say I've had zero complications. I've had less than 1%, but not zero. Only the Duke Laser Disc Repair for 14 years and over 1,100 surgeries now do we have a 0% complication rate, not a single patient with a complication. It's phenomenal. All right, so hopefully we'll be able to broadcast uh, this lady's recovery shortly. She should be waking up soon. And if she's agreeable to let us broadcast from the recovery room, we're going we're gonna to take a, a video and we're going to put it out there for you to watch. So keep an eye out for that, um, and we'll see how she's doing, okay? Other than that, have a great day. Sean, thanks for your help. Sean's done a wonderful job with our broadcasts, um, and we're really excited about some of the new features he's added. Anything else you want to say, Sean? That's it. Thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you. Have a good day.